there was a little Korean health food store. There was a health food store run by a Korean couple. And they became my best friends. And I'd asked them a million questions and they said, read this book, read this book. And I started on my journey at 28. And then I joined, uh, I joined a gym and I took aerobic dance class, which was the craze way back when, 78, 79. So I became a dance fanatic, John Travolta. So I became an aerobic dance fanatic. And then I learned how to play paddle ball. I went to the park and I started playing paddle ball with these old guys. And they beat the snot out of me. And to me, anybody 20 years older than me was old. So if you were like 45 and I was 28, you were old. So took two months, three months, four months. Eventually, I started getting really good at paddle ball. My eye-hand coordination increased. And then I made a commitment to run two miles every day for a year. And at the end of the year, I upped it to three miles every day. And the end of that year, I upped it to four miles. Eventually, I was running five miles every day. Rain, snow, sleet, or hail. I went out and bought sneakers that you could use to run in the snow and everybody thought I was crazy and I lost 40 pounds now in those days 40 pounds for a young guy that was a lot of weight because nobody thought I was fat except me I was 220 pounds and I'd walk through the airport and they're like oh look there's Franco Harris Franco Harris was a running back for the Pittsburgh Steelers and um, they thought I was Franco Harris, that big, beefy guy. I wasn't fat, fat. I was just, I was big everywhere. So I had a, had a huge neck. I had a 17-inch neck. I had a huge head. I wore a size 11 shoes. I had a 40, 46 jacket. I had a 38-inch waist. Maybe it was a 40-inch waist. So I was just a big guy and I lost 40 pounds and people said do you have cancer thank God there was no AIDS at that time and people thought that I had cancer because I had lost so much weight but fortunately there were some very kindly ladies who said you lost weight can you teach me how to lose weight and I was like teach you how to lose weight okay well you got to start running now I didn't realize that going on a raw food diet was the real reason that I had lost the weight I thought it was the exercise so I didn't read enough or maybe there wasn't enough information but I did the raw food diet completely wrong I just ate raw broccoli I ate raw carrots I ate raw celery anything raw I just <laughs> I ate it. I didn't cut it up. I didn't season it. I didn't marinate it. I didn't use digestive enzymes. I did nothing right. I did it all wrong. And I still lost the weight. But I thought it was the exercise. Well, the exercise kept me from having saggy skin. It kept me from having uh, skin folds. Um, so I was really lucky about that. But I started teaching ladies how to lose weight. So I had around my kitchen table. So every Saturday I had five or six ladies around my kitchen table and I was writing out diets for them. And I was teaching them about water and then we would go to the reservoir and it was a, a 1.8 mile track around the reservoir. So we'd walk, jog, walk, jog. So I developed this whole training regimen for these ladies. So guess what? I got a girlfriend. She owns a hair salon. So now I'm at her hair salon at closing and I'm doing aerobic dance in her hair salon. So she gets the bright idea to rent the place next door, knock out the wall, and then I'm doing aerobic dance in the place next door and weight loss. And I get a big following 
mainly because of the hair salon. And this is in 1979. This is like a way long time ago. So, all of a sudden, somebody comes and says, do you have a license to teach weight loss? And we were like, license? You need a license to teach somebody? You gotta be kidding me. So, I go to the library and there's a hundred books on how to lose weight, going back to 1950s. Books in the library, how to lose weight. I read five books a week. I was reading science fiction and technical books. I never knew that you could get a book on how to lose weight from the library. So I come back and I talk to my girlfriend and I was like, should I pursue a nutrition degree, a nutrition license? So we spent a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months talking about it. Do I actually need a license to teach people how to lose weight? Meanwhile, aerobic dance classes are like outrageous. So I've got my whole John Travolta dance routine down. And then we discover that medical doctors cannot write dietary prescriptions because they're not trained in nutrition. We find out that chiropractors cannot write dietary prescriptions. We find out that the only people who can write a dietary prescription are doctors of oriental medicine. So that sealed the deal. I was going to go to Chinese medicine school in Canada and learn dietary therapy or Asian food therapy to be exact. And that's what I did. So that was the start of my journey. That was 1979. The first acupuncture schools in the United States opened up in 1980. One in Boston with Dr. So and one in California. And I was fortunate enough to meet both of them early on before I ever graduated from the International Institute of Traditional Chinese Medicine in Montreal, run by Dr. Oscar Wexu, who was French. He was Romanian, actually, but he was French. And he opened up the first school in Canada, in Montreal, and I was in his second class. And I was very fortunate to meet uh, Elizabeth Rochat de la Belle, who's still teaching. She's still teaching. She lives in Paris, France, and I talk to her at least once a year. So some of you know that I wrote a book called Emotional uh, Mastery a few years ago, and she was the one who trained me in Chinese medicine, emotional therapeutics, from which I wrote my book. And um, it's just nice to know that the people that I started with 40 years ago are still around and still kicking. So you will hear me say repeatedly, consistency is the key to success and repetition is the mother of skill. And there's no way I or anyone else can say they've mastered every aspect of Asian medicine, even after 40 years, because it's so vast and so huge. But I've mastered enough to help people with cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. And I've simplified a way to explain how Chinese medicine works because most Americans don't know how it works. And a lot of acupuncturists really cannot uh, intelligently articulate how Chinese medicine works to the average person. So I'm gonna do so right now. We're still waiting for something uh, We're live with the podcast, no? Okay, so Chinese medicine is predicated. So we're starting the podcast. We're starting the podcast. It's introduction to the podcast. It's introduction in. to the podcast to the people who are just tuning in. So we're live on Instagram, we're live on Facebook, and we're live on YouTube. So the YouTubers caught the early part, 
and now we're here. Okay, so I've got three cameras, two cameras, three cameras. Just focus on this one. Focus on that camera. Great. So you may be wondering why I have sunglasses on because there's a really bright light <laughs> shining in my face, which is necessary. It's okay. I'm just going to wear sunglasses. I'll take them off for emphasis from time to time, but I don't want to be blinded. So that's why I have on uh, sunglasses in case you were interested. So welcome to the Ask Dr. Love podcast. As a doctor of Asian medicine, as a grandmaster of medical Qigong, Qing Lung, immortal Qigong, and a licensed acupuncture physician, and a Taoist teacher, and is a Tibetan Buddhist meditator certified in Yingma and Kagyu and Sakya uh, lineages of Tibetan Buddhism to teach people about Medicine Buddha and Green Tara uh, meditation. I am here to answer your questions about Asian medicine, breathing, meditation, hydration, psychotherapy, uh, Buddhist psychology, Tibetan psychiatry, Qigong, Tai Chi, martial arts, spiritual elevation, ancient history, particularly Persian, Greek, Roman, Tibetan, Egyptian, and the history of medicine and how it developed over time and what we can do to help you because it's all about me giving you information to improve your life, how to end your suffering. So on that note, uh, I'm going to ask the team, uh, has anybody chimed in? Does anybody have any questions? Well, I think it's best to go start with the subject right now because there isn't any questions. Okay, so the subject we're going to start with was, is, what is Chinese medicine? Why is it relevant? Why is it powerful? And why is it better than anything else that we have right now? And you're going to have to suspend your prejudgment of all things Chinese for the moment. So, uh, I'm sorry, RG asks, can you re remind and refresh my understanding of the importance of hydration? Okay, your body is 71% water. Please repeat the question when I ask. When okay, I so the question is, what is the importance of hydration? So hydration, water is H2O, that's two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. Your body is 71% water. That includes your blood, your lymphatic fluids, uh, your endocrine fluids, um, your uh, uh, all the body fluids, your interstitial fluid, that's the word I was looking for. So your interstitial fluids, all that adds up to 71% of your body weight. And a gallon of water weighs about eight pounds. So 70%, let's say you weigh 150 pounds. So that means 90 pounds of your body is water. Your uh, gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So you're about 11 pounds of fluid. That's a lot, 11 pounds of fluid inside of you. So what happens if you get dehydrated? What happens if you don't drink enough water? Well, of course, the government has done studies on this. And it was quite surprising, uh, the study on dehydration. The organs are not affected. The brain is affected and your emotions are affected. So when you are dehydrated, you get anxious and tense and it causes your muscles to contract and it causes your brain to desiccate, which means you don't get blood flow to your brain. 
which then obviously means you don't make good choices. Your thought processes are definitely diminished. So that is what happens with dehydration. So how do we get hydrated? Well, everyone assumes that all you got to do is drink water. Well, not exactly true. So if you just guzzle water all day, that's not going to hydrate you because you're going to pee right after you drink it. When I was a kid, I mean, I was over 21, but I wasn't 30. I used to drink a case of beer every weekend, a case. And I drink a beer, I pee. I drink a beer, I pee. So the water would just go right through me. And for those of you beer drinkers out there, you kind of sort of know that that is true. Alcohol dehydrates the body. So you drink a, a drunk, if you drink a lot of alcohol, you don't pee. So how do we hydrate? You have to drink with your meals, which is counterintuitive and counter to what you have been taught. So how do I know this? Well, the Chinese drink tea with their meals. They drink two cups of tea before, they drink tea with, and they drink two cups of tea after. Now, is tea water? Technically, tea is not water. You can't wash your dishes with tea. But the fluid is important for digestion and it increases the, the motility of the digestive organs. Motility is the ability to move the energy through. So if you eat and don't drink, then what happens is the food kind of slows down. Okay, and we obviously don't want that to happen. So you've got to drink two cups of tea before, drink tea with, and drink two cups of tea after every meal. Now for breakfast this morning, I had fresh pineapple in a blender with uh, ginger beer. And I blended that and that was exquisite. Last night, I made a drink with blackberries and blueberries and lychee fruit juice. The night before, I made a drink with watermelon and raspberries and rose water and coconut cream. So I'm always eating fruits which are high in uh, water content. I'm always eating salads that are high in water content. I'm always drinking elixirs that I've created, which I'm happy to share. And if you join the Patreon page, patreon.com slash D-R-Q-I-L-O-V-E, Dr. Chi Love, you'll get access to all that information. So um, what, can I, what else can I tell you about hydration? You need to drink at least three liters of water a day. So why three liters? Well, your body weight and you need to dilute the toxins that your body accumulates so they don't get stuck in your kidneys. Now everybody says, oh, drink water for your kidneys. You don't benefit the kidneys by drinking water. You prevent the kidneys from malfunctioning by drinking water, by diluting the toxins. So those of you who've been following me for years, you know I talk about juice feasting, where celery is 50%, carrot is 25%, beets are 25%. Then you add a piece of ginger, then you add a piece of turmeric, fresh turmeric root and we juice four times a day and that's juice feasting and what we want to do is drink water in between the four juices and that's how we rehydrate the body okay
Road Dancer asks, is apple cider vinegar healthy to add to water on occasion, once daily, mixed with fresh lemon? That is correct. You don't need... Repeat the question. Uh, okay, so the question is, is apple cider vinegar healthy to add to water every morning? Yes, it is. Do you need to add lemon to that? No, you don't. You can use lemon or apple cider vinegar. Either one. Fresh squeezed. If you're going to use lemon water, it should be hot. Apple cider vinegar should be room temperature. So a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in warm water every morning. Perfect thing to do. Mm -hmm. so what's, the, what's the importance of alkalizing the body? Okay, what is the importance of alkalizing the body? Um, 7.0 is neutral. 6.8 is acidic, 7.2 is basic or alkaline. So the body works more beneficially at 7.0. That's what we call pH. Most foods, particularly animal and uh, cooked foods, is acidic. They're typically 6.0 pH. Bottled water is 5.0 pH. Now we measure pH in terms of tenths. So 6.0, 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. So as we go up each point, that means it's a thousand times more acid or a thousand times more alkaline. So if 7.0 is neutral and that's where we want to be, if you go to 6.9, you're a thousand times more acidic. If you're at 6.8, you're a thousand times more acidic. Most people are somewhere between five and six. And I have um, test strips. I have pH test strips, which I can make available to you through our uh, Patreon page or our soon to be up Shopify page. And you can get these test strips and you can put it under your tongue and you can determine for yourself what your pH is. And that is why you need to alkalize. Now, is drinking 16 ounces of 9.0 alkaline water going to make a significant difference? No, not in a 24-hour period. But if you continually drink 9.0 over a month, two months, three months, you're going to bring up your normally hyper acid back to neutral and that's all we want to do. So that's why we do the higher pH water to neutralize the hyper acidity, acidity that we normally carry from what we eat. Okay, next question. How to regain the sense of the loss, the loss of taste and smell? Aha, I know who is that from. Okay, so anosmia is a loss of sense of taste and smell. And a lot of people suffer from anosmia, sometimes from chemotherapy, sometimes just from normal aging, sometimes from excess mucus in the head. So how do we get turbid mucus obstructing the upper portals? How does that even happen? So we know that stress and anxiety causes us to contract. We know that anger and frustration cause us to contract the muscles. Now when the, sh when the shoulders go up tight around the ears, then the neck contracts as well. So that restricts blood flow, blood supply to the brain. Now your body naturally produces mucus. So if you're eating a diet that's high in mucus forming foods and you have anxiety or anger, that's gonna push the mucus up into the head. And that mucus blocks the nerve endings that create loss of sense of smell and taste. So how do we regain that? Well, believe it or not, your taste buds are not limited to your tongue you actually have taste buds on the inside of your cheeks. And what kills those taste buds, besides cigarettes and alcohol, is caffeine, 
coffee, excessive sugar will actually kill the taste buds on the inside of your cheeks. So you have to go on a sugar-free, salt-free, caffeine-free, nicotine-free diet for three to six months, and then your taste buds will come back. We have to drain the mucus out of your head in order for your sense of smell to come back. And we're gonna do acupuncture in certain uh, points that I can either show you, you can either come into the office, or if you live somewhere else, and you have a local acupuncturist that wants to treat you, that's available to treat you, I'm happy to share those points that will restore your sense of smell. Serena asks, what herbs should I be taking in addition to practicing Qigong? That's an excellent question. What herbs should you be taking? From a Chinese medicine standpoint, we don't offer herbs over the counter or, or indiscriminate, take this herb, take that herb. And there's a specific reason for that. You have to be diagnosed. So you could be hot or cold. You could be damp or dry. You could be excess or deficient. So depending upon your diagnosis, we prescribe the herbs that you need. So for example, Everybody knows that ginseng is a good herb for energy, but ginseng triggers male hormone production. So women, unless they're over 60, unless they're not producing hormones, women should not really take ginseng. And a man who's under 40, he really shouldn't take ginseng either, because that'll yang him out and he'll become too aggressive. So that's why we don't just say, oh, take this herb, take that herb. You have to come in, we have to do an evaluation, and then we, we, we can determine what it is that you actually need. Now, there's something called astragalus. It's called young people's ginseng or women's ginseng because it's not connected to hormone production and you can safely take astragalus. Now, I'm not about to suggest you take astragalus pills. But you can buy astragalus in a Chinese market. You can boil it and drink the tea. And that way your body takes what it needs and excretes the rest. The second reason why people say, what herb should I take is because they're tired and they're exhausted and they think that the herb is gonna magically, magically restore their energy level. What you really need is sleep. That's what you need. You really, really need sleep. Now, having said all that as a prelude, there are 12 tonic herbs that anyone can safely take. And once you join Patreon, I will be happy to share with you the list of the 12 tonic herbs. And then in the weekly webinar, as a member of the Patreon group, I will share with you how to make teas and tonics using the 12 tonic herbs. Mm -hmm. right. So what green vitamin, you talked about iron deficiency yesterday, right? So you have to go to the first one. Somebody said, what green vitamin should I take for iron deficiency? Okay, so A, how do you know that you have an iron deficiency? So did you take a blood test? How did you discover that you are iron deficient? And I suggested they were liquid iron supplements that you can buy in a health food store. But it would be more beneficial because as a doctor of Oriental medicine, Asian medicine, I would not indiscriminately say, take this for that. That's a very Western mindset. I want to be specific for you. So, Iron deficiency? What was the other part of the question? That's it. That was it? It was iron deficiency. Okay. So if you take root, if you eat root vegetables on a regular basis, highly unlikely you're going to be iron deficient. If you take leafy green vegetables like spinach or collard greens or mustard greens or turnip greens or beet greens or Swiss chard, if you take leafy greens on a regular basis, highly unlikely you're going to be iron deficient.
So, Dr. Love, one of the people watching today came from seeing the Qigong this morning. All right. Which is awesome. However, someone from YouTube, Julie Borders, asked you, what's the difference between Tai Chi and Qigong? Okay, Tai Chi is a grain of sand. Qigong is the entire beach. So, Qigong is an umbrella term that includes all physical forms of healing. So, all of your martial arts, your Kung Fu, your Sanda, your Tai Chi, your Bagua, your Xing Yi, all of that is under the umbrella of Qigong. All your spiritual, your Falun Gong, uh, your spiritual elevation, your walking meditation, that is also under Qigong. And then there's Yi, which is medical Qigong. And I focus on medical Qigong because all of us have been damaged by our standard American diet. We've been damaged by our lifestyle. So you need the medical to start with, but then over time I will teach you the spiritual. And if you're a woman or you've been bullied, I will teach you women's self-defense or self-defense Qigong. So I hope that answers. All right, um, ask the if anybody watching have any questions. Okay, this is only a 20 minute podcast. That's it. So uh, we're, at, yeah, uh, we're at the end of it. We're right at the end of the yeah, so that's 20 minutes. Okay. That's great. So tune in tomorrow, 11 to 11.20 for the Ask Dr. Love Be Well podcast. Uh, uh, can you please tell the people about the course? So we have a online Qigong course every day, Monday through Friday. It's uh, 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning. It's online, but you have to register at lovechigong.com and that'll tell you how to register. It is $25 a month. The class is every day and the classes never go away. So if you start tomorrow, you have access to all the previous classes. So there's a lot of explanation. It's not just exercise. So there's breathing, there's meditation, there's movement, and there's internal exercise. So I go into the details of how it works, I make it fun, and I make it silly, and we use music, and you're gonna love it. So uh, lovechigong.com, that's Q-I-G-O-N-G. That's how to become a member of the online Qigong class every day. And then once a week we have a free webinar, Friday nights at 7 p.m. The webinar is free, but if you want the previous webinars or you, or you miss it and you want the replay, now you have to go to the Patreon page, Patreon slash D-R-Q-I-L-O-V-E, and that will get you all the previous uh, webinars. Uh, Audrey says, thank you, I'm a new Patreon of, pa of Patreon. She, she just joined. She just joined Patreon? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, and I just put all the links for the um, course. When they join the Patreon, do they get the course? When they join the course, do they get the Patreon? It's two separate. They are two separate things. The The course is a daily course. That's a separate fee from the uh, health literacy course. So I am a firm believer in the why before the how. And there's six things that I'm really, really concerned about. I'm concerned about your emotional health. I'm concerned about your operating system, whether you live your life with all-embracing love or whether you operate out of fear or anger or hatred. So those are two things. Then uh, I'm concerned about your diet, how to live, uh, how to eat like a god. Because God is man awake and man is God asleep. So we talk about, and the fourth area that I'm concerned about is to awaken the God or goddess within. Assuming you believe in God, God lives in your heart. We can discuss that or not later on, but if God's in your heart, how do you awaken to act as an agent of God? That's the fourth part. Then the fifth part is internal exercise. An internal exercise is your digestive and your reproductive system. 
So how to strengthen your uterus, how to strengthen your prostate. And then the last part of health literacy is how do you strengthen your internal organs. So that's six different areas in health literacy that's completely separate from the online Qigong class. So remember, your health is in your hands. Prevention is the only cure. And in order to be well, you got to breathe well.